We're fortunate to have with us tonight the film's director, Susanna Warlick, as well as Hannah Scharf Scharfstein, who you will recognize from the film and who is also a scholar of Scandinavian history related to the Holocaust. Without further ado, I will turn things over to Dr. Romer. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, let me just also welcome you again and remind you that indeed it is important for you to mute your respective microphones. I think Cindy might scan some of you because I still hear like something a little bit in the back of, of uh, my headset. But we want to start and um, give ourselves an opportunity really to have a conversation with our distinguished guests to discuss in particular the fate of Jews in these quote unquote three smaller countries. Some countries, the Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, that seem to often fall out of our respective view because when we think about the Holocaust, we are probably not surprisingly often uh, following scale. In other words, we often think rather about Poland or the Ukraine rather than maybe about Denmark. And if we're thinking about the Scandinavian countries, then more likely we'll be thinking often about Denmark and this very ex you know, exceptional history. But let me maybe ask the first question both for, for Hannah and Susanna. Why, why do you think, why is it important for us to know about uh, Denmark, uh, the Jews of Denmark and the Jews of Norway and the Jews of Sweden during the Holocaust? Well, I feel that it's extremely important because we're keeping the legacy alive of all these people who helped their fellow citizens and their fellow Jews. And um, I don't know, I feel like it serves as an inspiration to people to make sure to know that anyone can make a difference really. And the people that are highlighted in the film and their tales and their heroes, um, you know, they're dying off. And so the film keeps these people alive and keeps their actions alive. And courageous people do need to be honored because not everybody can be courageous as, as these people. They had nothing to gain from helping their Jewish neighbors. They just showed true kindness and compassion. So I feel like it is very important to portray this and especially to younger generations as well. That's my answer. And just to interject, because she won't be aware of it, Hannah, I did go ahead and mute you. So um, the feedback, I think, is coming a bit from your speaker, which is fine. So if you will just unmute yourself before you speak, and then we'll remute you when you're not speaking, if you don't mind. OK. Am I muted? You are. We hear you loud and clearly. Then. OK. OK. Uh, I am very excited about speaking about Scandinavia because that's where I grew up and that was my childhood was spent there. And I like, of course, the fact that the Scandinavian history during World War II, especially in Sweden, is one that's light, meaning that we had a beautiful life and we were able to help other people. So it's not involved with the tragedy that you had in Poland and the other countries that went through such horrible things during the war. So there, there's what I can take from both of the answers is that there is really something very specific that we can really um, take from these histories of these respective three countries and of other ways in which Jews were respectively safe. But if we start maybe with Sweden, then Sweden at first seemed to have been maybe a unlikely candidate for having been the country that ultimately ends up saving so many Jews. At first, um, they seem to be on the, and you say that quite well in the movie, uh, somewhere between neutral and a bit of accommodating to the Third Reich um, early on in the war. Would that be a fair way of, of characterizing the Swede, Sweden at, at the outset? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Sweden had also, now, right now, the, the queen in, in Sweden is German, from Germany. And there were other relatives of the royal family that came from Germany. So Sweden had good relations with Germany all along. And whenever somebody is neutral, there's no such thing as to total neutrality. You always end up leaning towards something. So if Sweden had not been positive in cooperating in certain ways with Germany, they probably would have been overrun like the other countries were. No, that's a really interesting point. And therefore, 
I think it's also telling that much of, of the dynamic change in 43, right? This is when also in many ways it becomes more apparent to, to many who, who pay attention that the Third Reich may not be invincible, that the Third Reich is, is not going to win the war. And that's in lots of ways, I think increasingly also with Sweden, where we start to, to see the change. But that's, I think, what's so interesting by looking at these three countries. We group them all together, but respectively, that each one has a very distinctive path uh, through this, through the Third Reich. So Denmark at first being the smallest of the countries, um, in lots of ways, very quickly surrenders, but yet is able to maintain, as you document so well, a certain autonomy. Their administration does not collapse. The king famously stays in the country, but therefore, they're in many ways um, more equipped to protect actually the Jews possibly than Norway is. Norway has a very different fate. How does it work out in Norway in your mind? Well, Norway had a totally different history. Norway only became independent in 1905. So Norway had not been independent for a very long time when World War II began. And they were fiercely concerned with being independent and not having somebody else rule them because Sweden had ruled them for a long span of time and they really wanted their independence. So they fought. They Of all the three countries, they were the only ones that put out a really, really big fight. And then they had Nazi sympathizers in Norway, the Quisling people. Quisling was a leader in Norway and he became synonymous with traitor and they had a Nazi party. So the Jews in Norway suffered a great deal. They lost half of their Jewish community in World War II. They were rounded up in center camps. So, it, but it is interesting. It's a country that fights, you know, very vigorously against the, the occupiers that ends up then being more acquiescence to the, to the Third Reich than, than the other two in comparison. Um, or so it seems. If we go back to Susanna, Susanna, you attributed everything to the heroic efforts of various individuals. Um, and I think the Danes and the Swedes, Sweden, Swedish people are the best examples of that. How about the German side? What role do they play? I mean, you attribute a great significance in the, uh, in the movie to best um, as being one of those individuals that, that is elevated because he kind of seems to swing in his view. Um, is there something to be said about the Germans having a slightly different plan or attitude toward the Jews or to the Scandinavian countries than, let's say, the way they uh, interact, you know, act in the Netherlands or in France or even in Poland or let alone later in, in Hungary? Is there something about the ways in which the Third Reich views these Scandi Scandinavian countries that is important for us to recognize? Well, as you saw in the movie, uh, one of the Danish citizens then said the Germans thought that the, the Danish people were misguided Germans and the Scandinavian people were the total Aryan looking people that they were trying to emulate. And so um, with Best, you know, he, he saw, from what I understand, he saw, you know, the underground um, gaining control and, and the resistance movement happening. And he knew that if he would round up the Jews, it would be all out war. It wouldn't be as easy as rounding up Jews that will, uh, you know, just go you know, quietly. These Jews weren't going quietly. The resistance wasn't going to let them go quietly. So I feel like um, the story goes that he intentionally leaked the news because he didn't want anything to happen. And by doing that and by the Jews escaping Denmark, he was really making the country Jude and free, that Jews were leaving Denmark without any of the hostilities that, you know, would go along with the way the other countries were rounding up the Jews. So I- Thank, thank you for, for answering that, but it is nonetheless a little bit perplexing because Best is the very one that initially orders the deportation. So he is, is in lots of ways, both the embodiment of, of Nazi 
policy of an attempt to implement the Holocaust, while at the same time he does then indeed give away the secret of the the, the coming of the deportation. So it's, it's a bit of a perplexing role that he seems to play in all of that. Well, I think that he got orders to right. um, round up the Jews. It wasn't his idea, correct, Hannah? Am I telling that correctly? Oh, you're- Hannah, un unmute, unmute yourself. yourself. Unmute yourself. I keep getting muted. Okay, I have something totally different to say. Uh, there's a shining example of a leader here, Christian X, who was an unusual leader, and there was no other leader that I know of in any other country who reacted to his Jews as being citizens equal to all the other citizens. So he was the one that inspired the Danish underground to save the Jews. He inspired the Danish people to protect the Jews, and he's the one that made Werner best. He made them realize that if they're going to round up the Jews, there's going to be a lot of trouble for the Germans who are occupying Denmark. So it's really it goes back to the leadership of Christian the Tenth, who was the one who really united the country and made them solidly concerned about the whole situation of the Jews. No, I think that's a really important point in that, you know, lots of ways is, is in, in Denmark, lots of ways, because the absence of a military conflict, the, so to speak, the government states, and therefore for the Danes is something still to hold on to and to identify with, whereas in Norway or in the Netherlands and other countries, the, the government collapse or escape into exile, and therefore it is much harder than to maintain any, any kind of semblance of, of some kind of sort of of, of um, resemblance of, of, of the traditional values and in particular of the idea of a state and its citizen, citizens that are to be protected. Nonetheless, you know, I think um, if we go into a different perspective, let's say to the Wannsee Conference of January 1942, then it's quite apparent that the Nazis had planned for the Jews of these three respective countries exactly what they had planned for all the others. So we see the Norway listed, we see Denmark listed, and we see Sweden listed under the category of countries not occupied um, by the Third Reich. But nonetheless, the numbers of Jews are totaled out just the same as they are for Poland or for the Netherlands or for, for France. So there's something that is, I think, from that perspective, almost already destined to happen, which however then did not happen. And I think it is probably for a mixture of these factors um, that Hannah just, um, highlighted Christian the 10th on the one side, and then also the growing resistance, uh, but also again, the, the, the heroic acts of these individuals. I mean, we have to remember that the saving of the Danish Jews in the end is done by endless amounts of individual fishermen, as, as one sees so well in your, um, in your movie. I think the movie early on occupies quite a bit of space with this early sequence, and then moves halfway into a very famous story, and that is the role of Raoul Wallenberg and, and then the saving of Hungarian Jews. And then we have one more kind of layer of time toward the end. Should we like move maybe into the middle part of your movie, into the discussion of, of Raoul and, and his various attempts to save Hungarian Jews? Yes. Um, you know, I, I, the focus of the movie was to capture um, Sweden. And so that's why I focused on any, anybody and anything related to Sweden. And that's how Raoul Wallenberg comes in. Um, you can, I'm sure you, you can make a whole other documentary about Raoul just by, it, by himself. But yeah, you know, he, he, here was a, a man who um, did miraculous things. And uh, it's so touching to see how he, you know, selflessly and and so courageously, he confronted Nazis. And but he was groomed to be a very good negotiator. And um, from early on, he was um, brought up really by his grandfather. His father had died before he was even born. The grandfather wanted him to be worldly. So he, you know, did things and sent Raul to different places, even including to the United States, to the University of Michigan, 
where he got a degree in architecture. Mm -hmm. um, but but I, I did read that, you know, he would hitchhike around and hitchhiking around helped him with his negotiation skills. So, you know, it, if you read things, um, it all says he was such a great negotiator with such uh, a presence to him that it's not surprising that the, you know, the Nazis were afraid of him or listened to what he had to say. And, you know, as we were told while we were interviewing people, he was like the right person at the right place at the right time. It's a very uh, common expression when you talk about Raoul Wallenberg. No, very true. Um, I think, you know, emphasizing the right time maybe here as well. I mean, he really exerts much of his influence at this tail end of 44, where everything gets immensely confusing because the Nazis are increasingly losing control. The Hungarian fascists are asserting themselves. The Russians are already kind of reaching, um, you know, quite literally uh, Budapest. And it's in that confusing landscape where he's able to pose quite literally in this very um, emphatic way himself as a, as a as a diplomat who asserts his power and his authority. But I think it is also possibly facilitated by this very confusing moment where it becomes apparent that the Third Reich is, is something that is, is not gonna last much longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, okay. and then it's the big mystery and maybe Hanna can help us. Um, what happened at the end to him? What did, why do you think, uh, is he ultimately presumably killed um, or dies in prison? There are about as many theories as I have fingers on my holes of my hands, but why do you think what happens ultimately? Well, it was very interesting when we were making the documentary, I actually spent quite a bit of time in the home of Nina Lagergren, who's a half sister to Rolf Waldenberg. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had a room in the house, by the way, that was totally decorated with all the things that he had received, with all the things that he had when he was growing up, and then all the awards that were sent to him posthumously and things. So she showed me a book, it was the size of, uh, it was a really, really big book, I would say, bigger than, as, as big as, as a, uh, one of these big art books that people have that they use for a coffee table, and it was like really thick. It must have had, must have been like 10, 12 inches thick, the book. And this book was filled with letters and documents and appeals that the Lagergren family, and of course also her half brothers and the Dardell family had made on behalf of the brother. Because the mother was obsessed from the minute that he was lost in 1945 to find him. And they tried to get the Swedish government to help out, but the Swedish government was totally, totally cold about the whole thing because they were really, really afraid of antagonizing Russia. And if you look on the map, you see the size of Sweden next to Russia. You can kind of understand why. So they just kept it cool and they didn't want to make a big thing about it. But Nina went with her mother numerous times to Russia and they wrote letters and they had lawyers and all kinds of appeals. So it was a collection of, I guess, 20, 40, 50 years of work that they had from 1945 till 1945 when he disappeared till the time that we made the film was in 2007 when we went there. And uh, it was just unbelievable how hard they tried to find him and the different kinds of stories that they got and the different reports and there's no really exact proof that you could say of what happened to him because there were all kinds of rumors that were talked about the tall Swedish man that was in the prison there. So some said he had died of pneumonia and some had said that he died of a heart attack and some said that he was actually executed. But definitely, unfortunately, he did lose his life there. So exactly how, we don't know, but we know it was in June in 2000, in uh, 1947. July, yeah. yeah. Susanna? July, 1947, sorry. July, July. yeah. I mean, they, you know, when we uh, interviewed these Swedish diplomats as well, um, they did a whole big research, like 
from uh, 1991 to 2000, and it was supposedly a, a Swedish-Russian uh, collaboration. Uh, you know, Sweden had all of these, um, you know, all of these papers, and Russia came up with uh, such little papers. And at the end, after all those years, nothing was conclusive. They still didn't know because the Russians first they said that. Um, they didn't have any records on Raoul Wallenberg, but then that was proven wrong. And then they went ahead and said he died of a heart attack in 1947, which we have some uh, uh, people saying that's crazy. You know, he was a young man. How could he die of a heart attack? And then, but other writings say, you know, when they say a heart attack, uh, it's another way of saying, okay, they, he was executed. So, but the family never received the body. They don't know where the body is. And of course there are writings that he was cremated, but you know, they, no, nobody ever came up with a conclusive and the Russians aren't going to say that they, they were wrong. They are sticking to their story that, the, that he died of a heart attack in 1947. But, um, and I just read that, uh, you know, the family asked the Swedish government to declare him dead. And, and the uh, declaration of death would, would be five years after um, they actually saw him alive. So it was 1952, uh, July 1952, that they officially uh, said he was dead. Um, so yes, very sad, very sad. Thank you. Um, if, if it's okay with you, I wanna move us to the last segment because I don't wanna use my privilege here too much because I know there are already quite a few in the chat chat um, window that are posing questions and our other visitors also want to have a chance to ask a question. So the last segment also concentrated on Sweden, focused on Sweden, Claude Bernadotte and Heinrich Himmler. In many ways, if you know, up until this point, the movie had already brought up quite a few confusing or, or interesting stories. That is probably the, one of the very last ones that once again, seems to be a bit perplexing that all of a sudden we have Himmler from all the people uh, who is consulting now with Bernadotte about ways of, by which one could save Jews. Would you mind speaking a little bit more about that and why you thought that that was important? Um, again, I wanted to focus in on Sweden. So Count Volker Bernadotte was from Sweden and of course the Swedish Red Cross um, played a major role in bringing in refugees during the last couple of weeks of the war and even after. And it was lucky for us that we had survivors. Um, if you saw Magda on the, in the movie, she came while the war was still on and had a totally different experience than Yenti, who was Hannah's sister-in-law, who came after, and Lanky Rothman, who came after, all on the white buses. Um, so, I, and with Himmler, you know, everybody at the end of the war, you know, I, I want to call it a spade a spade, but, you know, these high ranking uh, Nazis, they, they saw their future. They're going to be held accountable for these crimes and uh, everybody's trying to help save Jews at the last minute. Um, so. I thought that was important to tell, especially since we had the we had um, survivors who had experienced uh, coming to Sweden. And as you saw in the movie, when they came to Sweden, it was like coming to paradise um, from the hell that they were in. Thank you. Hannah, you want to add anything to this? You have to unmute yourself. <laughs> we were getting good at lip reading, but we're not quite proficient yet. There you go. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, uh, there were people in Sweden, Jewish people in Sweden, who were the ones who initiated the discussions with Himmler. It was a whole big story that they got involved with the Masur from Finland. His name was Kirsten. And they got him to speak to Himmler about it. And there was a whole group of transition. They, the uh, Swedish Red Cross were helping Scandinavian prisoners of war in the concentration camps. Mm -hmm. And they wanted that to be extended to include all the Jewish people who were in concentration camps that could be helped. 
And so there was a tremendous amount of work that it, it was just so interesting that even the last few weeks of the war, the very last few weeks, when you knew that it was going to end, that they managed to take out thousands of people who probably would have died in the death marches. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like, why were they rushing to help them out? Well, had they not done that, those people would have died. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, in Stockholm, in the not in Stockholm, but in Malmö, which is in southern Malmö. Sweden, which is the first port they came to in Sweden, there's so many young people who died soon after they came because they were so sick. But at least they had the privilege, the honor of being buried in a grave and having a marker for their name. And even that was like a big thing. So Folke Bernadotte really was very helpful in negotiating this and that was a tremendous big thing. No, that is a very powerful part also, again, of your movie when uh, we, we are at Malmö at the Jewish cemetery and we see all the gravestones of all those and then we see the dates, um, September 45, October 45, um, that reminds us that some, you know, you know, in many ways were saved but could not be ultimately saved because they were so sick so that they then died indeed um, in Sweden. Now, before we hand over, let me just, because we talked a little bit about, let's move a little bit forward. Three countries respectively with very other and very distinctive histories of the Holocaust. How is that shaping today's culture of remembrance in these countries? We talked earlier, just before everyone joined us about Liebeskind Museum in Copenhagen, which is a, a, in lots of ways a museum and a testament to the courage of the Danes, right? That's you know, one way I think of how one can make sense out of it, that from the Danish perspective, what matters about all of that is really to remember how courageous the Danes were. How's that in the other two countries for Sweden and Norway? Is it there more complicated in terms of what is remembered um, or is it similar um, that it's in particular for Sweden, that it's more the histories of, of, of saving Jews that is, is elevated? Susanna, you might want to speak to that. You also have to unmute yourself, Susanna. Unfortunately, um, you know, there were Norwegian resistance helpers as well. Mm -hmm. So um, unfortunately, I, I was able to go to only get in touch with one and um, it wasn't a good interview because we didn't um, speak uh, the right line. Yeah, it was through the computer, it wasn't. But um, there were Norwegian resistance fighters that did help people through the forest. Mm -hmm. um, I think in all countries, there are people that, you know, uh, come through with their kindness and compassion and don't stand by and help Jews uh, survive. So I, you know, but it's leadership. It's exactly what Hannah was saying. Mm -hmm. It's the leadership. De Denmark was very lucky to have such a wonderful king and stood up for the Jews, but Norway didn't. Norway had Quisling, who went along with the Nazis and, you know, very anti-Semitic. And, and also in Norway, they rounded up the Jews in Norway very early on in 1942. Um, so that was kind of like the beginning stages of rounding up. And that was what was happening. By, by 1943, 44, you know, more resistance was uh, occurring. So, um, you know, they, they had, they fought against it more. So, you know, the Norwegian Jews were a little unfortunate in that respect. Um, but luckily- It's true. Mm -hmm, yeah. It's, you know, no, very good point that the chronology matters here a great deal, that yeah. the Norwegian Jews are deported in 42, whereas the attempt of, of deportation of the Danish Jews happens late in 43, when there were lots of things, the whole landscape has already changed. Let me now pull in Cindy again, that she can help us with uh, pulling out some of the questions from our other uh, visitors here in our Absolutely. little online discussion. If you don't mind, Cindy, nope, not um, at all. do you look in our mailing box and see what we find? All right, so we've got some comments and some questions and some mixture thereof. Um, to piggyback off of the discussion that you just had, uh, Susan Myers, who's actually one of our co-sponsors today, asked about how anti-Semitism is in Norway today. And I would like to also expand on that and ask you to address anti-Semitism in Denmark and Sweden as well and see how Scandinavia as a whole 
or individually is, is um, anti-Semitic. Hannah, you're good at you, you. You should answer this question. Unmute yourself. Okay, unfortunately, there is a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism in all the Scandinavian countries, but I, I really feel and believe that a lot of it is due to the immigrant population that came in and that the immigrant population that, especially in Sweden, which is a very large group of people, is like a tremendous number of people, 20% of the population in Sweden today are immigrants and they come from countries that are hostile to Jews. So they have really spread a new attitude toward the Jewish people. And I think in Norway, there was always a bit of an attitude toward Jews. Uh, it even started in Denmark where they never really had it before. But it's, it's like anti-Semitism is a sickness and it's something that's it's just like Corona. It just spreads from place to place. And uh, if there aren't enough people around to really take a big stand to educate the young people and stop it, it's just a very dangerous situation. Thank okay. you, Cindy. Thank you. Yep. Another reach into the little mailbox there. What else do we yes. find? Uh, another comment we have is that it was very interesting to learn how the Swedes were open to the survivors uh, and all through the war. So I wanted to read that comment. One of the, we have a, a comment that I think leads into a question. Before the war, the Swedes would not give refuge to Jews. Germans could pass through even train convoys. In 1942, when Norwegian Jews entered, they softened. Could you speak a little about the softening? Um, well, I think there was a lot of pressure and people attempted to come and return back and then I think uh, with the way the war was going, um, they were seeing that the Germans were kind of losing ground. And that's when they, you know, said, oh, okay, we have to go on the right side of history and now bring, take in the Jews. Uh, you know, that's what I understand. Hannah, do you have any other facts about that? Well, the truth of the matter is that, uh, in the beginning of the war and right before the war, the same every country in the world, there was no place for Jews to go, including the United States. Everybody put up barriers and Jews really could not go anywhere. The Germans said you can leave our country, but they had no place to go. You know, from the Wannsee conference that Niels, we were talking about, no country wanted to receive Jews except the Dominican Republic and that's where some people went. But uh, it was a situation that was extremely, extremely difficult in every single way. It's, it's, it was just overwhelming, the whole situation. And when the Norwegian people came, of course, Nor Norway and Sweden have a border. You don't have to cross any water or anything. You go through the woods and you come into the country. And they came in, and I guess you couldn't turn them away. They they were just allowed to stay. But when the Danes were coming into Sweden, there was a whole big talk whether Sweden was going to let them in. And it was actually Niels Bohr who was in atomic energy. And he was the one that spoke to them. And he said that he's not going to come out of and help out in any kind of way unless they let the Jews out. And actually there were also stories of Greta Garbo, who was the famous Swedish film star and the one that was her producer that they also went to the King of Sweden to plead with him to let the Jews come in. So it wasn't like a quick thing that overnight it happened. They had to really convince the Swedish people to let them in. Thank you. Um, one point of clarification that was requested in the chat is to clarify to make sure that it was Denmark whose King quote, refused to give up his Jews. Yes. That's Christian X. That is correct. And then I had a private message talking about, uh, and this may be a Dr. Romer point of clarification, clarifying that uh, it was the Budapest Jews who, who were still there by the time Wallenberg arrived and that half, yes. a, mil and, and half a million Hungarian Jews had already been deported. In right. Before yeah. This is, so you know, to so many of our guests tonight, this story of the Hungarian Jews is obviously familiar through our founding director, Zsuzsana Ashwad, much of what is 
who, who is a survivor from, from Budapest. And so much of what is in your movie uh, about the Budapest Jews reminded me of, you know, times of her story and how she was saved by her nanny and brought from one house to another house, another house, and, uh, how she also talked a great deal about, about the Swedish uh, safe houses. I mean, one other thing, maybe just to jump in as we are, you know, emphasizing these courageous individuals, Christian the Tenth, and then um, the Swedes. And one one thing that I found really remarkable, and which I hadn't fully understood before, that I learned from the movie, it's not just that the Danes save the Jews, but they keep their houses unharmed. I mean, that's what I find. You know, it's one thing to do something at one particular moment, but it's another thing then to leave all of these apartments and houses untouched so that you know one of the stories that you tell in the movie is is really when the family returns they pull out the key they open the door and the table is, is essentially still the way set as it was when they left so that's i think is really remarkable in particular if we remember again what the nazis do to um, abundant uh, um, empty apartments elsewhere they loot them on a large scale in Paris and elsewhere to bring all, to all the belongings into the Reich. Again, something that did not happen in Denmark. The Nazis never went after the property of, of those that had been saved by, uh, by the Danish um, fishermen. So that's, I think, is a really, really um, impressive moment in the movie when all of a sudden that story had been told about how the Danish Jews return and find their homes unharmed. You know, I wanted to bring this up because it touched me so much when we were filming. Um, we were on, you know, trains and buses and Hanna was very good at speaking to everybody um, while we were traveling. And when we um, were interviewing people from Denmark, um, and this was on trains and buses, um, there was a lot of noise, but um, when we asked them about, you know, what they knew about the Danish rescue and what they thought about it, all across the board, they all said, it was just the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do. And it was like, oh my God, so touching that uh, the whole nation, it's the right thing to do. I mean, what the, the people who were involved. And so um, since it was too noisy on the trains and buses, I had to put it in the narrations, <laughs> but, but the, only because more than one, at least five people said the same thing. So it was, really amazing to, to hear. Uh, no, along those true. lines in the chat, we were asked as well, is the history of how their courageous ancestors supported the Jews taught today to the children in, in Denmark? Say that again, I'm sorry. Are they teaching the it in school? Is the history today taught in, in Denmark? Uh, is, it, is it important to the school not, curriculum? Do you know about that? In Sweden, they are teaching um, about the Holocaust, but in Denmark, do you know? Well, I'd like to say two things first that I think are very important. You have to understand the nature of the people from the Scandinavian countries, or at least my experiences with the ones in Sweden, and I know I'm sure for Denmark and Norway the same. They're extremely uh, peaceful people. They're not people that like to get into heated arguments. You don't have a lot of shootings in the street and a lot of street crimes of the native people. And they're kind to each other and they're very honest and they're very decent people. So, for example, if you're in a store and you buy something and it's happened to me and you end up leaving the package because you just simply forgot it. And then you go out to eat and then you say, oh, my gosh, I left my package in the store. And you go back and it's in the same exact place where you left it. Nobody even touched it. And I know that would not happen in New York City. So it's a different kind of people that you're talking about. They're not the kind of people that you feel are going to take things from you, that are going to you know, grab things from you. It's that kind of society to begin with. Now, Sweden did something fantastic. They have a whole company, a uh, part of the government actually, and it's something that's called Levande Historia, which means living history. And under this project, the Levande Historia, they produced books about the Holocaust millions of copies that they gave out to everybody in the country who wanted it, to all the school children and adults, all about how evil war is and how evil hatred is. And the name of the book is Tell It to Your Children. And they had it in it's Swedish, of course, and they had it in English. 
So they really made a project of teaching it. And they now have a project in Sweden called uh, Tierschitz Gruppen. So, so it's, it's, it's really an organization about a teaspoon, which was based on an essay of a writer from uh, Israel. And he said that if you see something and you have no way of doing anything, so if you see a fire and you would take a bucket of water and pour on it, that's one thing. Or if you put a cup of water on it, but even if you have a teaspoon, just the action, and this became a whole organization that's called Tearsheds Order, of just making the youth aware that it's important not to sit back and not to be complacent, but to take action when you see something that's wrong. So they are definitely trying to raise people's feelings and attitudes to understand how bad racism is of any kind. Thank you, Hannah. I think we had a follow-up question that just popped up, Cindy. Yes, would you please explain where Raoul Wallenberg got the money to buy the safe houses? Uh -huh. From the US so, government. Yeah. From, from the war, from the war refugee board, the US government was funding it, uh, along with other sponsors and Jewish organizations. But that's where he got the money. And the last I read was that they put a $50,000 in the bank account, but he ended up getting more money from other um, organizations as well. That's, that's where. Perfect. And then I know that this is a very complicated question with a very complicated answer, but how long were the Danes in Sweden? Oh, the Danes were in Sweden from the time that they came, they were there till the end of the war. So they were there for like, what, nine months or a year? Well, Something 43 like to 45, like a, a year and a half um, from Rosh Hashanah, 43 to 19. And some, and some of the young people stayed on because they got engaged and involved in schooling, so they stayed on. But most of them went back right after the war. Okay. Um, I got two private messages that are leading into that as well, asking me, um, and that's the complicated part, about the history between um, the Danes and the Swiss. Or the, not the Swiss, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Danes and Sweden. Sorry, I'm trying to keep track of the public chat and the private chat. A lot of people are asking me private chat questions as well. What exactly do they mean by that? The history of the Danes and the Swedes? The, the, relationship, the relationship. The complicated relationship and the, I know you touched on it earlier about um, one having a long history of independence and one having a recent history. That's Norway. Right. But the, yes. So if you could, that the main question at hand here from three different people is wanting a bit of clarification um, about the Danes and Sweden and their long history. Danes and, and how Sweden. that played into it. Well, Danes and Swedes, they, I mean, you know, they all consider themselves like brother countries. They're all like interrelated. The languages are similar. Uh, the, the money is different in each country and they each have their own political systems and so on. But they've always traveled freely from one country to the other. And there's like a brotherhood kind of feeling between these countries. There always was. Uh, they're a bit different. The Danes are much more... Uh, we're always much more easygoing. The Swedes are more reserved. The Swedes are more like proper. It takes a longer time to get to know them. The Danes are much more open and friendlier. So uh, but basically there's never been any problems or concerns, maybe back in the Viking days, but not in modern society, no. Did Sweden and govern Denmark at one point, Hannah? Did what? Did Sweden govern Denmark at one point? No, never. No, oh, okay. no. they had a Kalmar Union in the uh, Middle Ages that they all united to work together so that they should combat poverty and things, but no, no. Okay, and one of, the, messages, one of the people who had asked me just message again and said, thank you, they thought there was bad blood. That affected they were what? They said, thank you, they thought there was bad blood. So that was... That was oh, no. those no, questions. No, no, no. no. So I think that I think that that hits all of the the questions that have come through the chat, at least on the public side. 
and to be respectful of everyone's time because it is 745. I want to thank everyone for joining us and I also want to thank our speakers and we can all give a either virtual round of applause or an actual round or both. Thank, thank you all up, for joining right? us. Yes, a little bit of both. Loud, loud, loud clapping and cheering and, and again, thank you all for, for being here. And as we pointed out, some of our guests tonight can finally go to bed. Again, um, this is the beauty of these virtual meetings that we had some friends from India joining us, but they'll probably appreciate that they can also now just about, uh, you know, find themselves um, the, the end of their respective days. So thank you again so much, Susanna, and so much, uh, Hannah, for joining us tonight. It is really a remarkable story. And like I was trying to say, often forgotten because of the smaller size and scale, but as you're right, he said, Susanna, remarkable and what we can learn um, from it and what it can also remind us of that in the end of the day, our own individual actions can amount actually to something really significant, in particular, if it is sustained by a society that is supportive of it or by leadership, as it is, you know, was the case very clearly in Sweden and in Denmark. So there's much here to learn and also to embrace possibly for us um, in our very different own times and in our with our own challenges. So thank you again all for joining us. Uh, we all hope to continue to do many virtual events, but obviously also to have again in-person events on campus as we are slowly returning again to campus and to our respective buildings and to the Ackerman Center. So please stay connected and pay attention to all of the good postings that Cindy is putting out and announcements and news that are coming. And thank you again. Thank we you. made ourselves some two new friends. So thank you again for being with us tonight. Thank and to, to everyone who, to, I've got several private chats we didn't get to, but I took note of your name and I'll reach out via email. So thank you. And thank you for watching the movie and tell all your friends and family. Oh, we will. <laughs> Most Thank certainly. You. Thank you. Everyone have a good night. Okay. Good night, everyone.